This section of the module is a roundtable in which we're going to talk about some of the cases that we uh, saw and we're also going to tie these cases to some of the principles that underlie this module and those principles are or ideas are cultural capital, social networks, cultural values and assets, resilience, strength-based assessment and intervention, and cultural humility and those are on the screen. We started this module with an extended presentation about how we have attempted at the University of Texas at El Paso Department of Social Work to teach students how to be culturally competent and linguistically competent mental health practitioners. This project has been funded by the Hogg Foundation with the idea that what we've been able to develop here at an incipient stage has potential for application at other schools of social work, departments of psychology and counseling programs around Texas and elsewhere. So we tried to tie it to our context. And our context uh, we identified as being a border regional context. That's not to say that you um, need to think of the border as only that 200 miles north or south of that physical barrier between the United States and Mexico, but we identified the border as uh, the divisions among peoples um, along the axes of privilege and the divisions among people um, with respect to their treatment by majority culture, especially by law, uh, by law enforcement, by the distribution of goods and services, by economic justice and the lack of equal access to those things. Because we believe that when we talk with an individual or a group in clinical practice, that anything we're doing at that level is also within the larger macro context of how Hispanics function, survive, and thrive in the United States across the whole range of acculturation from people who have just arrived uh, to people who have been here prior to the Anglos coming into this region uh, as they did after this was at one time New Spain. We also think of borders as uh, being everywhere in the United States because whether you are in Duluth or in Napa, Idaho or in San Francisco or in Baltimore, um, you are also seen as different. You're seen as outside uh, based on where you stand on these axes of privilege. So when we work with an individual or if we work in a group setting, we're thinking of people as derived from and embedded in this particular context. Uh, we also talked about, um, apart from the Hispanic diaspora and the borders as being everywhere, the importance of understanding acculturation as a process um, with which people participate partially, fully, or not at all, insofar as one's adaptation to and adjustment to dominant American culture is not necessarily a unilateral process, nor do we think that it's healthy for it to be a unilateral process, because Hispanics, in order to be successful um, as individuals and as a group, obviously have to find their own voice and their own balance in, in dealing with majority culture. And that's certainly true in their own individual uh, struggles with the kind of pathologies that we see people coming into clinical settings and presenting. We also stress that those kinds of pathologies need to be understood not as, as um, within the person, but as within the, within the environment, uh, within the society, uh, and we take uh, a view which doesn't emphasize pathology, but emphasize assets and strengths. We also have talked in this series about culturally competent practice, about what that means, and identified some of the cultural values and principles that make for culturally competent mental health practice, and um, one of the key concepts there, I think, is resilience. And that is that we see resilience in the client as their capacity to, with, 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 to respond to uh, adversity and to recover from that adversary, adversity by virtue of their cultural capital and their cultural assets. Many previous investigations of how to work with the uh, minority populations, and especially with Hispanics and African Americans, has emphasized a deficits orientation, which is that when clients from this, these cultural backgrounds come into a clinical uh, or, or even just regular generalist practice settings, they tend to be perceived through the frame of a practitioner, even a non-Anglo practitioner, 
um, as uh, people who are a walking bag of deficits and, and problems. And we reject that completely. Um, the notion that somebody can be identified by what problems they have is anathema to the successful and, and I think clinically appropriate, culturally competent practice of mental health. And so we, we've argued from the inception of this module that that's the direction that we would like to take. With me today is Dr. Adam McCormick, uh, who, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Social Work. Um, Ingeniero uh, Jose Palomo, Joe, uh, who is a standardized client, standardized patient. Uh, Dr. Sam Terrazas, who's an assistant professor. And also Dr. Silvia Chavez, who is a, a lecturer in our department and a clinical psychologist. And so we're going to hear from them about the cases that we've talked about. Uh, first, let's talk uh, a little bit um, about the case that um, uh, S Sam had. Sam, could you tell us a little bit about the, the case that you worked with? This was with Alberto Garza. Uh, as I recall, he was a person who had served with distinction as an army officer in the Vietnam era conflict, mm -hmm. and that uh, his PTSD was more or less in remission, that had been a long, long time uh, survivor of trauma, but that more recently he was dealing with depression. And you were framing that in um, a culturally competent way. Is there anything that you could like to recap about that? Well, the most important part of the entire process was the engagement process. So we have a stereotype, and it's somewhat, you know, beyond a stereotype that Latino men are not going to be responsive to psychotherapy um, for many, many reasons, beyond the stigma of mental illness, but also the cultural values of, you know, strength and, you know, not wanting to let others see him or her, I mean, him be weak. So they're not going to want to come in and tell their personal business. And also, they, you know, Hispanic men learn or Latino men learn that, you know, your family business, your family business, and you keep it at home. So you're not going to really be sharing that with a stranger. So those are things that one must be very thoughtful about. So in the engagement process, to go very rapidly into a clinical exam would be not so useful because the client, Hispanic man in this case, would see that as disrespectful and probably not not be open to double, double, giving off the information that would be needed for the assessment. So it's really about timing and seeing that the engagement process in learning about the client in, in his life and his narrative is really important. So um, one would take a little bit more time in the engagement of a Hispanic male. Um, beyond that is to spend the time in understanding where the client is in their cultural continuum. We have clients who are recent migrants from various parts of the world, and then we have Hispanic men who have been here for three or four generations. So understand that cultural continuum and how their experience in their lives um, and their values that have been part of their lives, how that narrative and how they have weaved that into their practice in their life, of course. So that's really important because from that, one can, well, clinician can find strength, the resilience, but also a path for intervention. Um, the classical path in this case would have been he was depressed like, he had grief issues, so we could have potentially sent him you know, to a psychiatrist, we could have suggested various other kinds of courses for depression. However, that, would have, that wouldn't have been overly useful because he, would have not, he was not going to buy into those kind of traditional Anglo approaches to care. So what we did was we, I examined his context, his narrative, what was, where was his strengths, what were the things in his life that were really valuable? What were the social networks that were in his life? And that was the path for the intervention. And I think in the example, it showed very clearly that he was very open to those, including things that are common for you know good best practices, nutrition, exercise. But again, that was part of his life. So if it was a man who didn't have that part of his life, you may suggest it, but it would not have been something that you would be really hopeful that it would occur, I guess, is the, is the, is the point here. So it's what, what, is the, what is the Hispanic man going to be open to? How does the clinician engage that person in therapeutic alliance in a respectful and thoughtful way? And how do you sort of diminish these barriers that are there? Because the clinical skills that we're often taught are really not overly useful in these cases. Direct questioning, multiple questioning, you know, um, you know even reflection questions. I, you know, I'm not a question, but even reflection. Um, do you reflect really emotive kind of things to a Hispanic man? I don't think so. Um, he knows what he's what he's feeling and not, or not feeling. So you can say, yes, I see that you're sad, but you're not, not going to want to go into deep reflection as a skill. 
So um, in terms of that, I think that was really important. Um, but I want to get back to the idea that Hispanic men are not going to be open to psychotherapy. I think the problem has been historically is, is that clinicians haven't been open to Hispanic men because of the idea potentially that, you know, there's machismo and they're not open to it. And so there's this sort of mindset, and it's almost self-fulfilling prophecy, that if a Hispanic man comes in, oh, well, he's not going to want the services because he's, for whatever reason. I think that's not a good practice approach. I think a better practice approach is to look and see where one connect with, with a Hispanic man, see, again, what their cultural context is, understand who they are as a human being, because just because they're a Mexican doesn't mean that they're going to buy into, at various levels, you know, the importance of family. They will to some degree or another, but to what degree is it? So to really understand that, you really have to spend time with that with the client and asking those kind of questions. In this case, it was very clear that Alberto was very much connected to his family. In this case, his spouse and his and to, the cultural values of his grandparents and his family were very very clearly defined in his life, and that that played out in his, in his military career and in his life in general. So that made perfect sense. It was very easy to move from there to like, where, where are the real strengths in his family and his intervention in his family? <clears throat> rephrase. Where are the real strengths in his life versus the pathology? That would have been easy. That would have been a very classic clinical approach. Tell me about your symptoms. Tell me you know, about all your problems or whatever. And that would have just bought into the pathological sort of point of view. And that, again, would have probably pushed him away because he said, I am a strong man. I don't want to be seen as weak. And if I'm going to spend 15 or 20 minutes talking about his pathology, that would have bought right into his feelings of weakness, and that would have pushed him away. Right. And he's a man with a lot of pride. He had a lot going for him. In addition to which, you know, this reframing machismo, which is, we've said before in this module that it's framed as and perceived as a negative attribute. It, it's actually, when framed properly, a, a source of strength and a source of stru uh, pride in your ability to take a, a leadership role and to serve your family and to be a provider and to be a strength. Um, and he had a great deal of that. And the other thing that he had going for him, I noticed in, in uh, your conversation was he had a social network. Mm -hmm. He also had faith that he was going, he had fallen off that path, but not, but only in attendance, but he saw some value in going back and connecting with that, uh, with that community. And, and so there were a lot of things going for this client. Exactly, and that's where the intervention was. Mm -hmm. The intervention was reconnecting him with what was in his life already. And you know, when people are depressed or have a difficulty, they get tunnel vision. I mean, they lose sight of what their what their options are. And it was just really um, helping him see, like, hey, this is what's really in your life. And this, the probability of him going to his social networks that have been there in the past are much higher than say, well, go to a support group. Well, I'm not discounting. I'm a big fan of groups. I'm a mm -hmm. big, big fan of groups. And I'm talking about interventions with very specific populations, in this case a Hispanic man who had this, this very, you know, complex life course and he was in a very specific place, not uncommon to a lot of people who lose their spouse. Right. Um, but again, being thoughtful about where he was culturally and what was important to him was really what led me to, to the interventions and the pathways for him to get better. Right, and to normalize the grief process. Right. If I may add something, uh, I, I thought this was a particularly uh, interesting and difficult case because you had not only a Hispanic male, but also uh, uh, a gentleman who had been highly successful in the military. So, so he had, uh, you know, twice uh, the reason to be strong and to be a leader and not to show weakness. And he had already rejected uh, the approach, uh, the typical approach at the VA in other places and he had refused to uh, uh, to work with them to to find out if uh, if he had any uh, symptoms of mental disorders and and certainly he had rejected any kind of intervention on their part and it was because of the approach that they had taken so the the cultural based approach uh, it had a lot more chance of being successful with an individual such as this Good. Uh, Dr. Chavez, you said to the case of Liliana. Um, Dr. Chavez had the case of uh, Liliana, who was a young woman, uh, college uh, student, who had uh, very successful parents, very, very successful parents, and who herself was a high achieving student, uh, but had fallen into a path of uh, anorexia with bulimia. Um, 
again, had a lot going for her, but very, very high expectations. And how did you handle that from a cultural strengths point of view, uh, Doctor? Okay. Eh, eh, la primera parte eh, de la entrevista fue dedicar un tiempo a la empatía y a dejar eh, que se expresara. Para nosotros los mexicanos es bien importante el hablar y el expresarnos y el que nos den tiempo porque entonces nos sentimos escuchados. Después de este proceso de empatía fue identi identificar sus, cultura, sus valores culturales. Entre ellos está el marianismo que es muy fuerte para la mujer mexicana, que es la pureza, la espiritualidad, el ser perfecto. Y que le podemos decir, como un padre está una hija, tienes que ser perfecto en la escuela y eso llevamos a generalizar. Entonces es trabajar con la generalización y en reestructurar es, estos valores culturales como el familismo, eh, que es fuerte dentro de los mexicanos, el, la familia va a estar ahí para apoyar, es, principalmente en las situaciones eh, de adversidad, la comunidad, entonces es eh, identificar el familismo, identificar el marianismo, identificar el, el machismo, caballerismo desde este padre protector, proveedor, que a lo mejor es un padre ausente porque está muy preocupado en, en cuidar, proveer, buscar por el bienestar de la familia, no porque quiera ser un padre ausente, sino porque piensa que de esa manera va a sacar a su familia adelante y, y que si, si se trabaja la comunicación, este machismo, caballerismo del padre se puede jalar para ayudar en el, en el proceso de, de sanación. Entonces es identificar los valores culturales y reencuadrarlos a un lado positivo, como decía, utilizar la resistencia como asistencia y sin generalizar eh, las expresiones. Los mexicanos tendemos a ser muy expresivos y tendemos a manotear y no porque estemos manoteando quiere decir que seamos agresivos, quiere decir que estamos expresándonos y hablando con las manos. Eh, los mexicanos tendemos, si estamos tristes, a llorar y si alguien se muere, este, hay algunos pueblos donde todavía se contratan a las lloronas porque entonces el alma se ve ir al cielo y no porque se llora y se vive el luto es que estemos deprimidos y si estamos muy felices gritamos y festejamos y te, queremos un, un, un evento para tener fiesta y no por eso significa que seamos maníacos eh, y como profesionistas es bien importante el entender cómo nos expresamos culturalmente para que no se nos estereotipe y se nos diagnostique erróneamente. So you've emphasized then the importance of engagement, uh, which I think we've all seen that um, it's real important to make a connection uh, with clients. And we tend to be, uh, me as, a, as an Anglo, person who wants to cut to the chase to get right down to business and that really is a, a deficit that I have that I have to overcome to establish that relationship and in the in in your session you you took the time to do that and that's very important and you mentioned that in a, in a previous uh, conversation as well you focused on the values uh, that were at play in her family dynamic uh, one was her perfectionism which was related to Marianismo um, and and also the the sense that her family uh, through familismo in some res in some respects had become burdensome to her rather than the usual sorts of strengths that it provides to to clients because families are an enormous source of strength and recovery for people but when the family as is the case often in the an in the person with anorexia part of the problem uh, it was important for you to reframe that and you helped her see the family not so much as this. Um, uh, social unit that was repressing her, but actually people who were really trying to take care of her and look out for her and expecting the best of uh, out of her because they were providing the best for her. Uh, and then you, you also uh, talked a, a bit about the purposeful expression of feelings, uh, one of Bistec's casework principles, and how that might play out a little differently among Hispanic families and clients because of there's, there's much more expressiveness and not to see that expressiveness as overexcitability or uh, those sorts of things, but actually as, as a normal and purposeful expression of feelings and, and to not label that. Um, that's, that's very good. Thank you very much for that. 
Um, uh, Dr. McCormick, you had a, a, a very interesting case. Um, this was a young woman, um, Jessica Lopez, who had um, was portrayed by an MSW student uh, who was a little older than the case, but we were presenting a case of a woman who was 16, um, and she did a very good job of portraying the, the, the real harm that had been done to her by having been sexually assaulted. But the dilemma for her was that her dad had said some things to her which were really hurtful and framed it net rather negatively about the manner in which she had been dressing and the manner in which she was appearing to invite sort of unwanted uh, uh, in sexual, she was invitational in her style. Could you comment a little bit about the dilemmas and how you framed that and helped her reframe that? Sure, sure. <clears throat> you know, it was a complex case in that it was a, a trauma case and like you, you know, I, I have this tendency to just want to dive in and, and start addressing those issues. So, you know, as, as, as she was sharing this, you know, this sexual assault, you know, my, my immediate thought was, well, we're going to have to process this trauma and we're going to have to work on emotional regulation and all of those things. But I was reminded that, um, you know, the single biggest predictor factor associated with healing and coping from a traumatic incident is having a support network and having, um, you know, that family support and that, that, that strength. And no matter what I did, I mean, it, you could have the most fantastic therapist in there, Dr. Terrasas, Dr. Chavez, in there processing the trauma and, and, and developing, you know, working on the emotional regulation capacity so that, you know, when she's feeling these overwhelming feelings, you know, all of that stuff that we do with children who've experienced trauma or experiencing traumatic stress, you know, that no matter how good we are, if we send her back to an environment that's not supportive, um, you know, that, that isn't aware of what's going on, it's probably not going to make that much of a difference. Um, and as she was sharing more about her family, it was evident very early on that although, you know, her parents, um, you know, may not frame things in the most appropriate ways or, or, or may not, um, you know, may have some, some behaviors or, or some things that, you know, aren't that great, at the same time, there was a lot of love there. Um, this, this child was incredibly resilient, so one of the things that I wanted to do was to tap into, you know, how she'd been so resilient and, and what role her family played in developing that, that sense of resiliency. So I really wanted to, to start there, and I, and I found myself, you know, trying to, you know, back off a little. You know, when you have a child who's talking about cutting on their wrists, cutting on the back of their legs, I mean, you, you immediately want to want to talk about that, but um, at the same time, I knew the single most important thing was to try to incorporate her family and give, help her to, to develop the skill set and, and the courage to be able to approach her family about what happened to her, because she'd gone two months, I think, without, without doing that. So, um, you know, I really just wanted to process, help her to process that and ask some questions around, um, around that, um, specific to the dilemma that you talked about, the, you know, dad making those comments. And I really wanted her to process where those comments came from. And, and, and in doing that, I, you know, I had to, you know, again, think about my own privilege, uh, you know, being trained in Western feminism and, you know, um, having access to all of this knowledge and information and thinking, wow, that was a really inappropriate thing to say. But at the same time, as I processed that with, with Jessica, it was evident that, you know, she really felt like it came from a place of love. Although, she, you know, didn't want to, to minimize it and didn't want to, um, you know, discount, you know, what a bad thing it was to say. She was able to really process, well, this comes from a place of love. He was trying to protect me. He made those comments. And for me, I was reminding myself, well, you know, that, that's where that, you know, he doesn't, may not have access to all of that information, all of that knowledge, you know, that we might have um, as social workers or therapists in, in that type of stuff. So I think it was effective for her to kind of process where that's coming from, because it was a, an issue that kind of had taken a life of her own. I mean, it was the biggest barrier to her telling her parents was that she felt like her parents, were, her father was going to be ashamed of her, um, that he was going to ascribe some of the blame to her because she was at this party she wasn't supposed to be at, she's wearing these clothes that they've been feuding about for a long time. So I wanted her to process that and see, um, um, you know, if if she felt like they would be able to to get beyond that, and even if that that there was some element of that, um, you know, allow her to talk about what that would look like and what that would um, uh, be like. And I, and I was thinking a lot about some of the work that we've done here with with Hispanic Latino youth on the border in terms of um, you know, with the trauma and then being able to um, be incredibly resilient in, in understanding that and really that issue of love and that issue of nurture, um, you know, just taking priority over everything else that's happened. And also with LGBT youth that we work with on the border. Um, you know, when we share with my colleague and I are, have worked on some projects and done some things around family acceptance. And, you know, we have a lot of Hispanic Latino families here on the border who 
um, you know, have theological, ideological beliefs around sexual orientation that, you know, it's sinful, um, and there's a lot of shame around that. But once we start sharing with families, well, you know, I understand theologically, ideologically, you have issues with this, but let me just share some research with you that, you know, your reaction and how loving and how nurturing and how accepting you are around this issue will largely predict more than anything else, um, you know, your child's well-being and whether or not they might be suicidal or whether or not they might have substance abuse issues or engage in risky sex and all of those things. And when we do that, especially with the Hispanic Latino families, they are very receptive to that. Um, and, you know, they're a lot more open to dialogue and, and learning more about, you know, what's going on. And, 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 and so, you know, I wanted to incorporate some elements of that. This is a family who, you know, have said some things in the past. There are certainly some barriers and some challenges around this complex trauma that this child experienced. But, you know, I just think that love and that nurture and that critical mass of, of um, affection that she was going to be given um, was going to be the single most important thing to helping her deal with this long-term process. And, and eventually we'll get to processing and emotional regulation and all that stuff that we know we have to do um, with children who've experienced trauma like this. But, you know, it's not going to do much good if she doesn't have that support system, if she's going back home to an environment that's not supportive, um, especially if it hasn't been given the opportunity to be um, supportive. No. You had mentioned in a debriefing we had after that session that you thought that uh, students that you had at a, at a small private liberal arts school of very privileged students had looked at that same interview and seen the case study, they might have responded very differently than the students we have here because they might have jumped right on that comment, in this case to refresh your memory, where the, the dad said, you're dressing like a prostitute, you're inviting trouble, I don't like the way you're dressing, you, 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 it's inappropriate. And the use, the word, the use of dressing like a prostitute was essentially an insult and that your students might have framed that differently. You want to sure. talk about Yeah, that? yeah. I mean, I, I think um, a lot of colleagues that I've had, I mean, you know, um, you know, especially, you know, those of us who try to incorporate some, you know, feminist work into to, to the work that we do with families, you know, I think we would have, you know, heard that. And my immediate thought was, well, that's why, and it is, it was a, a very inappropriate comment. Uh, you know, but I think, you know, when you look at all these issues, cultural capital values, all that, I mean, you have to see where that's coming from and be able to identify the strengths and the resiliency within that. And I think students on the board, students, you know, anywhere who are, who are very sensitive to cultural issues and, and, you know, everything that you're, you know, focusing the series on um, are going to be able to do that of, with any type of, whether it's, you know, Hispanic family, African American family, Caucasian family, or we're talking about issues around, um, you know, sexual orientation, gender, I mean, you, you have to be sensitive to that and understand, uh, you know, families uh, with LGBT kids, I mean, you know, it's, it's very challenging because, you know, oftentimes they're very rejecting and very hostile, um, but you have to understand, you know, where that's coming from. Oftentimes, you know, they're really worried that their children are going to be mistreated or that they're going to be bullied or teased or not, you know, stigmatized, all of those things. And you want to incorporate that love and that concern and that care into the work uh, with them. So yeah, I think that, that was a good example of that where, you know, I think a lot of students, a lot of very tenured clinicians would have, you know, struggled with that and really focused on, uh, you know, critiquing that. And, and he deserved some critique for that. And I think we did a little bit of that and said, you know, it's probably not appropriate to have said that, but where is it coming from? And to be able to identify some of the resilience and some of the strengths within even comments like that. When we teach this class, the uh, assessment and intervention in Spanish, we actually use the same framework that we've identified here in recognizing that our student body, which in, at, at the Department of Social Work at UTEP is 82% uh, Hispanic and, and more so than that even in our classes, um, that we also have to bring the same sort of perception of cultural capital and resilience and strengths-based uh, approach to teaching. And so taking the clinical model out into the, into the pedagogical model we can make the comparison that when we when we are doing this coaching, as we call it, of students with standardized clients, uh, and and taping them, and showing those tapes back, and and debriefing them, we're using a strengths-based approach. We don't crit criticize uh, explicitly things that they have done wrong in in quotation marks, but rather things that they're doing that would be better done in a certain manner. And uh, Mr. Palomo has uh, a lot of experience as a standardized patient, not only here in our School of Nursing, but in our Department of Social Work. And uh, Joe, could you talk a little bit about what you've learned as a standardized client, standardized patient? Well, yes, of course. 
Uh, as you mentioned, I started out as a standardized patient over at the uh, nursing school where I was uh, uh, a patient with uh, some sort of a physical uh, problem. Uh, and then I transitioned over here and I started working with, uh, with the school on behavioral issues and mental health issues. Uh, but uh, as a standard, standardized patient, both in the nursing school and, and here at the, uh, with the social work, uh, I have to present a, a case uh, to a student in the same way. Uh, it, I, it cannot vary, my presentation cannot vary from student to student because that, that introduces another variable into the whole equation. And so, and so um, uh, my role is to receive a case, uh, usually a couple of days be, before we do the, the interview or the assessment or the intervention, intervention with the student. And uh, the case will come from the standard um, literature uh, and I will translate that, that case or transpose it into a local scenario. I will reset the case uh, and put it in a local scenario. And it, when we are teaching uh, or when we are coaching the students on uh, cultural competence, I will make it a case where I'm a Hispanic male, uh, I'm from the border area, uh, I have certain issues. So I'll develop the, the background for this individual, the personal history, and then I will present that case to, uh, to the students. Uh, after the students have done their interview or their assessment, uh, then we will have a session when I, where I can provide feedback to the students so that, so that I become uh, a full member of the coaching team that's working with these, uh, with these students. Yeah, it's important for uh, the student to hear from the, the, the client's point of view because um, Joe, as, as someone who's acting out this role, is living in that role. He's, he's rehearsed it, we've coached him, we've actually shown him videotapes of somebody with that particular uh, behavioral health issue so that he can play it out. Uh, and then he, he can watch them do some of the things that novice therapists do, like fidget, not engage in good eye contact, not establish a rapport, not build the relationship not follow up on the questions that need to be followed up, not reflecting back the emotional content that they're hearing. And, and Joe's every bit as good at, as doing that as, as Adam or Sylvia or, or any of us. Um, one of the things that uh, I'd like us to take away from this module is that as college professors and, and as teachers, we come from a point of view of privilege and we often forget that. We don't realize uh, even if we started humbly, uh, that how far we've come and how much that shaped who we are as teachers and as therapists and as social workers. And there's a term in cultural competence that I haven't mentioned so far in this series that I want to just say a few concluding remarks about, and that's the, the, the notion of cultural humility. Um, if you look at one's perspective and place on the axes of privilege, whether it's uh, uh, heterosexual uh, to homosexual continuum of uh, gender, uh, you know, all of these things that we see in terms of education, class, and so on, we pretty much as college professors sit at the top of that heap um, in, to a large degree. We tend to be overrepresented as members of the majority culture. We are products of that majority culture to a large degree. And to, with that privilege, I think, comes a lot of cultural arrogance and the notion that we really know better, that we are we're in a better position by virtue of our training and the many years that we spend in school and in practice to sort of teach people how to do their jobs. Um, when you teach in a school like this school, you need to set those aside. And I would argue pretty much anywhere you teach social work, you need to set those aside. It particularly serves you poorly if you work at a minority serving institution such as this and increasingly all institutions in the United States pretty soon are going to be minority serving. This is the demographic of the United States now and will continue to be that demographic. And more than being culturally sensitive, we, mean, we need to be culturally embedded. And that means that we need to put aside this notion of privilege that somehow we're experts on everything and become more, much more culturally humble. And by that I mean openness to learning uh, from the perspective of the client and the, the ability to Genuine, gen, genuinely be empathetic with, with, with people who are significantly different from you and who do not share in the same kind of privileges and advantages. We hope very much that this module has been helpful to you in thinking about your teaching and um, also to your students.
in so far as you want to adopt some of these. We're available to you. Uh, there's information at this module about how you might contact any of us, including Mr. Palomo, about how you might proceed in taking some of these ideas and making them come alive in your own department and school. So thank you very much.